Okay. Yes, thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you, yes, very good. All right, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Uh, I can tell my students uh, from the other students. I need some energy over here. But there is uh, some seats over there. So, oh, there is one more there as well. Yes. So, um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. There it is. That is the energy Victoria needs today. Yes. So, um, we have a special guest today. Her name is Victoria Lily. She is from Milwaukee. Uh, 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 no, what was it? Milwaukee. Milwaukee. Yeah, she's from Milwaukee. Yes, um, um, in um, Wisconsin, um, in the United States. Yes, she will tell you where that is uh, um, really soon. But um, she's been um, a, a language assistant at Diego Muñoz Torrero Elementary School here in Valdemoro for two years. So she is the one who is responsible for our little kids' pronunciation. And that's why our little kids' pronunciation is perfect now, after two years with Victoria, yes? Anyway, um, she's been here for two years, but not only that, when she was in the United States, she taught Spanish to English-speaking people. So she has some international experience on bilingual education. Um, how Spanish is taught in the States, or at least her experience, because there are many experiences here. And also, she's got the experience here in Valdemoro, the center of the world. <laughs> and the way we teach English here, yes, in elementary school. So, um, I would like to start with a nice round of applause for Victoria. talking about bilingual education in the United States and Spain, at least my experience. Okay, so a little bit about me. This is me, my graduation photo. Um, my name is Victoria. I am from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I graduated from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee in December 2020, um, the middle of the pandemic, as I'm sure we all remember. I graduated from the College of Letters and Science with a four-year degree in Spanish. So as Fernando said, um, this is my second year here in Spain as a language assistant, and I'm at um, Diego Muñoz Torero here in Valdemar. So where is Milwaukee? A lot of people, <laughs> a lot of times I just say close to Chicago because most people have an idea of where Chicago is. Um, so Milwaukee is here and Chicago is a little bit south, about one hour or so driving from Milwaukee. So it's very cold. We're almost at the border with Canada. Um, it's a little bit smaller than Madrid, Chicago is about the size of Madrid, and Milwaukee is about half of that size. Okay. So here's what we are going to look at today. First, we will look at um, today we'll look at some language statistics in the United States, um, specifically um, bilingual programs and immersion schools in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. My personal experience teaching Spanish um, to English-speaking students in Montessori, which is a type of bilingual school. Um, then my experience here in Spain as a language assistant. And finally, just talking about some similarities and differences between <coughs> the educational systems and approaches here. Okay, so some statistics about Spanish speakers in the United States. So we all know um, the, the United States has people from multiple cultures, um, but Spanish is the second most spoken language in the United States. We have over 42 million people speak Spanish um, as their first language, and 15 million speak it as a second language. Um, I recently read something that there are more Spanish speakers in the United States than all of Spain. So we have a lot of people who speak Spanish and we actually don't have an official language. So many people, this was something I recently learned in the past few years, 
The U.S. does not have an official language, so our official language is not English, it's not Spanish, we, we don't have one. Um, also, because of our <coughs> closeness to Mexico and Central South America, there are a large number of people who immigrate, whether as children or adults, and they live in the United States. Um, some cities, such as Miami, San Diego, Corpus Christi in Texas, Los Angeles. Um, there are parts of the city where everything is in Spanish, so maybe not the entire city, but parts of the neighborhood where the people, most of them may not know any English at all. Um, we're language professionals, which is an after-school program for children of mixed ages in primary school, so 5 to 11, um, that focuses on using games and activities to make the children interested in learning Spanish as souls in the U.S. So there are more than 3,600 um, DLI, or Dual <coughs> Language Immersion, programs in the U.S. Spanish accounts for about 80% of the programs, um, followed by Chinese and French. But as you can see, Spanish is 80%. Chinese is 8.6 and French is 5%. So the difference, you can see the majority is Spanish. So I'm going to pull up this map. And this will show... Let's see what's down here. Okay, well first we'll look at this table. So here we have the number of dual language immersion programs. Spanish, we can see, is 2,936, and the second one, again, is Chinese with 312. So you can see how important and how, how many more programs for Spanish specifically are available in, in the United States. And here, we have a map, and this was from 2021, so it might have changed a little, um, but we have the the density of these programs. So you can see the border states, specifically Texas and California, have a very high number of these programs. Um, and Wisconsin, you can see, doesn't have that many, but it's still a large number of, um, of programs. So what you see about Milwaukee, imagine that even more numbers in, in the states here with more, with more than two. Half of the students are maybe very young, and they come from Mexico, Puerto Rico, South America, so they were brought to the United States at a young age, and they speak Spanish at home, but now they need to speak English at school. However, there are also English speakers, so people who speak English at home, but their parents want them to have um, a bilingual education, so they're also allowed to enroll in this school. Um, also with these bilingual schools, additional ESL classes, so English as a second language, are available for native Spanish speakers. So for example, if you come from Mexico, South America. Okay, so here's, um, I just did a quick Google search. I put bilingual school, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and these are just a couple of the different schools. Um, this is the south side of Milwaukee, um, where we saw the, the mural. So here we have the three bilingual schools, um, and also here is the Milwaukee Spanish Immersion School. So there are a lot of options. Um, again, Milwaukee is not that large of a city, but we have many bilingual schools. There are even more in bigger cities such as Los Angeles, in Texas. Um, so parents have the option of choosing which school they want to go to. Um, it's not, there's not a limited, <laughs> number of these bilingual schools. So here's an interesting graph from the Greenfield Bilingual School. Um, this is about the race of the people in that school or the children. Um, you can see it has 98.1% minority enrollment, meaning that the majority of students at these schools are not white. They are um, Mostly Hispanic or Latino, 90.7% are Hispanic Latino, Black or African American, and only 1.9% are white. So 
Again, Milwaukee is a small city, but we have a large population of um, Hispanic and Latino people, and this, um, this number would be even greater in areas like Los Angeles or in Texas that are closer to, to the border. Yeah, I was telling you. Not come from the United States. A lot of these people, um, they might be first generation, meaning they, they were born in the United States, but their parents were born in Mexico, or they could have Mexico or another country, but, um, or they were very young when they, when they moved to the United States. Okay, so here's just a little bit about the um, Milwaukee Immersion School. Um, it says here the students, or the school's immersion program offers English speaking students an opportunity to learn Spanish and to appreciate the cultures and customs of Spanish speaking countries. Formal English instructions begin at the, um, the end of grade two. And so a lot of um, people who already speak Spanish will generally not go to the Spanish immersion school. It's more of um, for the English speaking students who want their children, the English speaking parents who want their children to become bilingual. Um, the people who come from other countries and already speak Spanish at home will generally go to the bilingual school because they want to learn English and in these immersion schools, um, like I said before, they don't, they don't s start teaching English until, until later. So here's a picture of the French immersion school, the one that my nephew went to. Um, Again, they, they don't speak any English at all in these schools until grade two, and so they really start them from, from a young age, and it's fascinating really to, to see this because even though my nephew, um, my whole family speaks English, he still, with this intense or this, <coughs> this much French exposure, he was able to pick up that second language more quickly than, than English. So now here in Spain, um, the government of Spain and other private programs contract people from English speaking countries and they put us in bilingual schools here, um, not just in Madrid, but all over Spain. So I think the most popular one is NELCAP and that one is through the um, Education Ministry of Spain. So with NALCAP, you can be placed all over Spain. Um, I was lucky and I was put in Madrid, but um, you can be <coughs> in, in Murcia, in France, or the English language assistant. I work here in Diego Manuel Torero. I've been here for two years. This is my second year. Um, so at our school, the students have natural science, social science, English, physical education and also arts instructed in English. So their, um, their textbooks are in English, their homework is in English, the tests are in English, everything is completely in English. And the teachers really make an effort to speak zero Spanish in the classroom, at least for these classes. Of course, sometimes um, it's necessary to to translate some things, but for the most part, in these English classes, it is exclusively in English. Um, so the responsibilities of language assistants um, depend on which classes we have and what grade level that we are teaching. So in Diego Munoz Torreno, we have from infantil, so the very small children, up until sixth grade. Um, I'm working with fifth grade, so they're 10, 11 years old, and we do a little bit more advanced stuff. Um, the fifth graders are preparing, or will be preparing for the Cambridge exam in sixth grade. Um, so we really start to focus on that in, in fifth grade and more advanced things to cover um, reading, writing, listening and, and speaking. However, with some of the really young kids, they are still learning Spanish. So um, they will do more games, more visual things, 
um, hands-on activities, not so much worksheets or, um, or things like that that we do with the older people. Um, because we are native English speakers, our primary goal, at least in, in our school, is to focus on listening and speaking. So there are a few things that we've noticed that people have trouble with um, in when they're learning English. So our goal is to take that and make it as perfect as possible. Um, we work with a variety of students um, from all levels. And it's interesting um, for me because there are some students who have no English at home or their parents don't speak English, but they have a very high level. There are also some students who have two parents who speak English and they have a very low level. So really there's no, um, how can I say, there's a variety of levels within the same classroom and under different, different circumstances. Um, so our goal really is just to get them to speak as much as possible because I'm sure most of you know um, it's easy to read and write and listen but learning how to express yourself to to form a sentence can be very tricky so we want them to feel confident and comfortable when they speak and especially with the more basic phrases and basic grammar um, so as I said earlier the classes are instruct classes are instructed in English by the main teacher um, and my responsibilities mostly speaking to us I really focus on speaking with my students um, we talk about a variety of topics um, so that they can feel comfortable having daily conversations because so many times um, you know we learn about hobbies or food things like that so we try to um, help the students be able to talk about many, many different things. Um, I also work with students with a lower level. Um, so I might take them out in smaller groups and depending on what issues they have, um, we, I will help them in a smaller setting because a lot of times students feel more comfortable speaking in small groups instead of the whole class. So. It really, um, it depends on the day, but um, that's the, the primary the primary goal. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely challenges with bilingual schools. They're not perfect by, by any means, but from the students that I've seen that they make an effort to, um, for example, I have some students who only speak English with me. Every time they're with me, they really make an effort to only speak English, and those students typically do very well um, compared to you know some other students who maybe know that I understand Spanish so they, they speak Spanish um, to me but um, it's not a perfect system but I think it's it's overall beneficial and um, we do see a lot of improvement with the students who um, who do make the effort and who do you know do the homework practice everything like that let me people give you an example Miami are from Cuba and so if you want to get a job in Cuba, you would have to learn, um, learn to speak Spanish or... And it is a truly bilingual city. Mm -hmm. You go to Miami and they switch from English to Spanish and from Spanish to English mm -hmm. so fast. I mm -hmm. mean, they speak both languages so well. Yeah, it's so much more integrated. Um, I told a story the other class. I was on the south side of Milwaukee where I lived for four years and I went to the grocery store and there was... Um, a white guy in, in the grocery store and he was trying to find corn and he was getting visibly frustrated because none of the employees spoke English. And so I, I stepped in and I helped him translate, but it's a situation like this, you know, that might come as a surprise. You think everyone speaks English in the U.S. or I have to, I have to learn English if I want to go to the U.S. And depending on, on your city, um, you know, that's really... Um, not necessarily true in some cases. So, <laughs> and yeah, I think I think that's. Cool. <laughs> Questions? Not everybody. Decides.
same time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which language do you think is harder to learn? Spanish or English? Oof, I mean, I, I think it depends what your first language is. Um, for example, if you speak English learning Spanish, it's the same alphabet, so it's a little bit easier. Um, if you speak Italian, learning Spanish is probably even easier, but if you're speaking Japanese or Chinese, trying to learn English or Spanish, um, I think that would make it a little more difficult. But in my personal experience, Spanish is a little easier because it has more grammatical rules and it follows a lot of rules. So, and the pronunciation, um, in English we have a lot of silent letters and extra letters, but in Spanish, however a word is spelled out, that's how you pronounce it and <laughs> that's it, yeah. <laughs> when, um, of course,